First of all, on behalf of Scirocco, the U.S. Embassy, Nairobi, and the World Bank Group, I extend a warm welcome to the Somali Investment Forum, Returning Capital for Growth. I'll, I'll start the clapping. <laughs> uh, so uh, we thank you all very much for coming this morning and for your patience last night with some of the check-in uh, snafus we had. We ironed much, many of them out this morning. We still haven't ironed out all the print uh, issues, but we're getting there. Um, promotion for this forum has covered sep over seven countries and multiple stakeholders, including diaspora, organizations, donors, investors, and policymakers. While we would have loved to reach more, our effort has been to reach as many as we could with the resources we've had. This forum convenes under one roof over 200 stakeholders representing the Somali private sector community, local and diaspora, entrepreneurs and investors, cooperatives and associations, bilateral organizations and NGOs, and policymakers. Some of you have come to elicit letters of interest and catalyze investment. Others are here to find promising businesses in which to invest in or contribute your expertise to accelerate private sector growth. We encourage you to make full use of this forum to network, get to know your business, your other businesses involved in your sector, talk with investors, make connections, and get to know one another. And I know that's not hard for Somalis. Uh, you all get to know each other very quickly and very well. Whenever I go to Minneapolis, I go to the Starbucks in Minneapolis, and instantly I'm at home. Just that's an aside. That wasn't part of my speech, but. Uh, <clears throat> um, we hope this uh, event proves beneficial beyond the sessions. The forum's success will come partly from what happens in this two and a half days together, but even more so from what happens after we've all gone home. Our goals for the forum are to help entrepreneurs attain letters of interest that will move through due diligence and hopefully go to full investment. Advance dialogue on issues that affect both individual businesses and associations alike. Work cooperatively to identify business regulation and policy recommendations that can solve problems and grow a healthy economy, and promote a level playing field that encourages healthy competition, which in turn will benefit all Somalis. Scirocco, the primary organizer for the Somali Investment Forum, is a nonprofit implementation project of the One Earth Future Foundation. Operating throughout Somalia, Scirocco believes that a healthy markets and, a good, and good governance mutually support each other. Scirocco, Somali for partner, I guess you can tell me, is it Somali for partnership? Partnership, uh, agree, yeah. Um, facilitates investment in promising Somali-based businesses, which fosters a marketplace that encourages economic development and stability throughout the region. Scirocco itself is not an investor, rather acts as a neutral broker, evaluating and managing potential investments, creating relationships throughout the supply chain, and structuring Islamic finance compliant investments. In the process, Scirocco hopes to catalyze economic development and expand markets for goods and services and encourage investment and trade, which together stimulate job creation. Scirocco believes this, uh, that these efforts will culminate in a stronger private sector, which will contribute to greater peace and stability. Since mid-2013, uh, Scirocco has been operating on the ground throughout the region. Today, there are two permanent offices that service the entire country. Uh, one is in Garraway, which services Garraway and South Central, and it's a mobile office in South Central in Mogadishu, and also an office in Hargeisa. We facilitated an investment portfolio in just under two years of $1.7 million across 37 deals. Um, job creation due to these investments is projected to be around 711 jobs, of which 287 are jobs for women. Okay. Scirocco will, will consider any merit-worthy business, regardless of sector. However, historically, our top three sectors in descending order have been, according to size, have been fishing, agriculture, and livestock. So let me thank, first of all, the co-host uh, and our strategic partners for the forum. Our co-host, the U.S. Embassy and the World Bank Group. Strategic partners, World Bank Group, U.S. Africa Development Foundation, UNDP, IFID, Silatech, Frontier Investment Management, Bid Network, scholarship sponsors, the Hobsho Bank International, International Bank of Somalia, First Somali Bank, Arsenal Family Foundation, uh, USADF, UNDP. Others, Juba Airways, 
Juba Airways went out of their way to help us get the uh, entrepreneurs here, and we are really grateful to, for them. Uh, Safari Park Hotel, and of course, all of, our, all of our volunteers. And if I've missed anyone, I apologize. There are others that were supportive here, but as you're making agreements as to whether or not you put up logo and all that, sometimes um, uh, you have to work all those things out in detail beforehand. But they know who they are, and we're grateful to you, and we appreciate you, and we hope to have you uh, uh, up here soon. Okay, so let me introduce to you um, uh, uh, some speakers from our, our co-hosts. Let me introduce to you, first of all, Brian Phipps. Brian Phipps is the Deputy Special Representative for Somalia, the U.S. State Department. He arrived in the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi in September 2012. Prior to this assignment, he was Counselor for Political and Economic Affairs in Riga, Latvia, 2009 to 2012. He served on the Secretary's Policy Planning Staff from 2008 to 2009, where he was responsible for Sub-Saharan Africa and international organizations. He was responsible for regional uh, counterterrorism policy in East and South Southern Africa for the State Department's Coordinator of Counterterrorism from 2006 to 2008. Born in Nebraska, Brian attended Yale University, where he obtained a, a BA degree in history. As a Fulbright Scholar, he received an MA in history from Victoria University, Wellington, New Zealand. He has worked in Mogadishu, Somalia, Merida, Mexico, London, and United Kingdom, Lahore, Pakistan, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. In Washington, he has served as Bangladesh desk officer and as Kenya desk officer. So now we'll hear a few words from Brian. Thank you, Lee, for that kind introduction. Uh, first, let me say how pleased I am to be here and for the U.S. government to be co-hosting this event with Scirocco. It should be an important and productive three days, and we are impressed with the press attention and the turnout for this event. For over 20 years of civil strife, Somalia's private sector survived without a functional government. The private sector remains an integral part of furthering peace and stability in Somalia, and we look forward to working with the private sector to advance the capacity of the federal and regional governments of Somalia to regulate and govern the country and its economy. Somalia's economy is showing signs of benefiting from improved peace and security. Cement sales are on the rise, real estate is at a premium, and construction sites can be seen everywhere. Diaspora are beginning to return to Somalia, and with them, they bring needed investment and skills. Somalia has started to attract foreign investment, and that investment brings the need for local businesses to compete on a global scale, and for the government to regulate the economy and allow the private sector to create as many jobs as possible. The private sector can be a catalyst for change, and the U.S. recognizes the importance that the private sector plays, particularly in a country like Somalia, which is known for its entrepreneurial spirit. The United States is the largest bilateral donor to Somalia, and we are invested in enhancing the return to stability through our various institutions and programs, such as USAID's transition initiatives for stabilization, strengthening Somali governance, and partnership for economic growth. The Partnership for Economic Growth program expanded its activities throughout Somalia, including in agriculture and livestock, renewable energy, and private sector development. The Partnership for Economic Growth's previous successes include producing comprehensive investment guides for Somaliland and Puntland, working in close cooperation with their respective chambers of commerce. The United States is also committed to strengthening the capacity of the Federal Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank. The State Department is working in cooperation with the Treasury Department's Office of Technical Assistance to implement a training program around fiscal transparency with the Ministry of Finance and a training program with the Supervision Department of the Central Bank. Throughout all U.S. programs, we seek to work together with our Somali partners on the ground, and we understand the vital importance of the private sector in helping achieve common goals. We appreciate the focus of this first Somalia Investment Forum on energy, and particularly renewable energy. USAID's Partnership for Economic Growth Program funded a number of renewable energy activities in Somaliland, 
which led to an increase in the number of commercially viable companies specializing in renewable energy, including Golis Energy and Tayo. As you are all aware, Somalia has some of the highest prices for electricity per kilowatt hour in the world, at an average of $1 per kilowatt hour. To compare, United States residents pay only an average of 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Somalia's private sector will remain less attractive without serious investment in the electricity sector. The President's Power, Trade and Af and Power Africa and Trade Initiative focused on bringing power to unserved neighborhoods and populations in six initial partner, in partner countries, including Kenya and Ethiopia, illustrates the importance that the United States gives to expanding access to electricity in Africa. We hope that Somalia will one day be a partner country for the Power Africa Initiative, which is, which is in the process of expanding, but Somalia first needs to develop the capacity to govern and regulate this essential sector. All of these examples have a common theme. The private sector can serve as an important mobilizing force to encourage governments to enact laws and regulations to expand the economy and to govern effectively and transparently. We know that the private sector is one of the most powerful voices in Somali civil society, as evidenced by the strong membership numbers at the regional chambers of commerce. We hope that this forum can be the first of many where the focus on how the private sector can create linkages to effectively lobby the government at both the federal and regional levels to pass necessary legislation to create jobs, deliver services, and improve the competitiveness of the economy. Somalia is a country that is blessed with natural resources, but in order to avoid the oil curse that has plagued other nations, the federal and regional governments must be able to transparently manage funds and pass legislation that ensures that Somalia's plethora of resources benefit the people of Somalia and create jobs. Taxation is one of the federal government of Somalia's priorities, necessary to be able to fund its ability to deliver essential services to the public. The private sector is instrumental in demanding transparency in how government collects and uses those funds. It is the private sector that can most effectively demand a change in the government that oversees the economy. In conclusion, I am honored to be able to support and officially open the first Somalia Investment Forum and hope that this can create stronger linkages between the United States and the Somali private sector to promote common goals. The United States recognizes the vital importance of the private sector to achieve change and promote stability in Somalia and encourages private sector actors to come together to effectively lobby federal and regional governments to create an enabling environment for Somalia to further develop its economy and manage its resources. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Brian. I already made my first mistake by not getting the PowerPoints right, so I've got a little team down here that points to me and says this, this, this. Uh, now uh, to uh, our other co-sponsor, the World Bank Group. Manuel Moses is responsible for I I I IFC's activities in the East Africa sub-region while managing a large multidisciplinary office. He has over 20 years banking experience in covering East and Southern Africa. Prior to joining IFC in 2005, he has held senior positions at Zimbabwe Development Bank, ABSA, CBZ, and PTA Bank. Manuel, a Zimbabwean national, is an enrolled associate member of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants of the United Kingdom and holds a master's in business administration from the University of Leicester, Leicester UK, and a bachelor uh, with honors in civil engineering from University of Zimbabwe. Oh, well. Thank you, Lee. Um, I think uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, you know, Somalia is finally taking off, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, to, my, uh, <laughs> to, my, to my, uh, my colleagues, Brian, thanks for the, for the open remarks. To Shari, who's going to speak after me, thanks again. And all, all protocols observed. 
really my mind is to just try and you know emphasize that the World Bank Group is behind Somalia and World Bank Group uh, would, would do its part in trying to partner with the private sector in Somalia. So on behalf of the World Bank, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this event where the Somali people and the friends of the Somali people gather to discuss an important topic of returning capital to kickstart the economy and to foster job creation. Let me thank all the organizers. Matufa. Let me thank all the organizers, uh, Shurako, the US Embassy, and all other contributors who have made this uh, event possible. For the next two and a half days, you are going to discuss very, very important topics, and we, we wish you all the best. We are encouraged by the excellent turn up. This is a full room, and uh, the contributions from different agencies as a gesture of goodwill and support for the Somali people. The World Bank Group itself is pleased to be part of this forum and as a show of solidarity and goodwill to the Somali people at this hour of great need and the great optimism and opportunity that arises. In a country that has been beset with conflict and weakened government, the topic of, of our discussion this week could not have been more appropriate. The key to unlocking potential and sustainability of the Somali people lies in a dynamic private sector. Working closely and supported by a strong government, private, private businesses should lead in, in, in the healing process, breaking the, the boundaries and seeing all Somalis as its customers, regardless where they come from. Private sector all over the world contributes to tax revenue and job creation more than the public sector. I'm aware that the Somali diaspora sends over $1.2 billion annually to back home. We need to see how we can best step into this diaspora and locally based private sector to kickstart the economic growth, which would ten, in turn create jobs for the youth and warrants peace and stability. I would, I would also like to emphasize that the development partners and civil society can only support and, in, and not, not to, be, to take the place of the Somali people themselves. We know that entrepreneurs are scattered all over the globe, from Minnesota to Oslo, and from London to Cape Town. I am from Zimbabwe. I know that there's a Somali community there also. So the diaspora is quite, quite large. And I'm hoping that part of the discussion will see how we can effectively tap into the skills and the resources of the Somali diaspora and to partner with them, with the resident Somalis, to support economic revival. Within the World Bank Group, I, I, I sit at the IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Our focus at the, at the IFC is specifically on the private sector. But of course, the World Bank Group does, as a group, we also cover the, the, the government and uh, the surrounding issues. So we would like to really emphasize that IFC is the private sector arm. So you should be talking to IFC when it comes to the private sector in terms of your engagement as the private sector. We are helping, of course, we work with the other agencies like the MIGA, which is the multilateral uh, investment guarantee agency of the World Bank Group, to see how we can give some of the comfort to some of the investors who are thinking of coming to, to invest in Somalia. And we are, we are hoping to focus on the areas of bridging the infrastructure gap. We are hoping to focus on the, the productive sector. He has mentioned, Brian mentioned, I think, uh, that the electricity is very expensive. The, those are opportunities that could be looked at by the private sector. But of course, this needs a, a, a regulated environment that supports uh, such investments. We'd also... As, as we have a group focus on you know, building the economic stabilization, set the function, that provide analytic work that helps the opportunities to be realized, uh, trade and competitiveness issues to look at how you guys are operating, wh wh where are the laws that are supporting private sector dialogue. We are also want to contribute to you know, access to finance, working on, with, the, with, this, with the central bank, working with the, some of the banks that are coming out in, in Somalia, how they can improve access to finance. Uh, as you know, in October last year, our World Bank Group, together with the Secretary General of the United Nations, visited Somalia. Just, just to show that the World Bank Group in, in whole is looking at Somalia very seriously, that it could not, we could not get <coughs> any higher official to visit to support that we are indeed looking at Somalia in a, in a, in a different uh, angle, because we are seeing that indeed it's about to turn the corner. Millions of youth are unemployed. And we know that with, with, with our, our help and with partnering with you, we could make a difference. We urge all the stakeholders to play their role in, in this development. You as the private sector, like I said earlier on, are the key determinant. And we as the IFC are willing and, and, and to work with you and partner with you 
But of course, there are challenges. Let's, let's, let, 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 let us uh, also be realistic that there are still challenges. The laws are not yet in place, but peace is coming. But we need to show the, to, to gather the momentum and create that uh, effect of, you know, looking at those green shoots of, of hope and supporting them. So, but of course, insecurity is, uh, is still an issue, but we think that it's, we are about to turn the corner. And we as the IFC and the World Bank Group are right behind you. And I look forward to engaging with some of you in the next few days so that we can see how we can support those green shoots. With those few remarks, I thank you and I wish you all the best for the next two days. Thank you, Manuel. Brian and Manuel. We appreciate the support of the U.S. Embassy and World Bank Group. Without the support, events like this are almost impossible to achieve. Before introducing our keynote speaker, let me take a few minutes and share some thoughts about why this forum and why now. When we initially conceived this forum, we thought maybe we'd get 120, 150. Um, we got a lot more than that, a lot more response. And I know there were a lot more that wanted to be here, many who had difficulties of travel or, or business constraints or family constraints. I've gotten numerous emails, believe me, uh, all the way leading up to this, and we're very grateful for the outpouring. But as you can see by the attendance, we've exceeded that, and that's a reflection of the timing and opportunities for business growth in Somalia. As you've heard earlier, Scirocco is a program of the One Earth Future Foundation, a nonprofit peace-building organization, but as you can tell, our activities are grounded in promoting responsible private sector growth in uh, the uh, private sector growth because private sector growth creates jobs. Our goal was to add value, just like your goal is to add value. If you're a business, you need to add value, otherwise you don't stay in business. So we looked for gaps in the current market, market conditions to see where we could contribute. And what we know is there are many resilient and talented Somali entrepreneurs, the majority micro to medium in size, the largest employer by far, but primarily, but uh, much of it is informal. Their barriers to growth are essentially fourfold, peace and security, access to capital, the opposite end of access to capital, which is the high cost of doing business, primarily the cost of electricity, and then reliable and well-trained workforce. So for business to grow, and which in turn creates greater employment opportunities, these barriers need to be addressed, and this takes a conscious effort across all stakeholders. It requires a certain discipline to move from conflict to peace, from a dependence to a prosperous society, and build an economy that rewards responsible private sector growth. Responsible private enterprise is the epitome of sustainable development. Responding to the profit motive, entrepreneurs invest in ideas and facilities that nurture opportunities that employ local talent and improve overall well-being. Sustainable development encourages greater civic participation and generates necessary resources to support effective governance. It's a reciprocal relationship that invites a positive cycle toward peace and stability. The turnout today, while it's impressive, is just a fraction of what's going on throughout all the Somali regions every day. When I've been on the ground, regardless of whether it's Mogadishu or Garaway or Bosaso or, or all these other places that we end up getting to, I've been impressed time after time meeting, with the, meeting, meeting the entrepreneurs and, 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 and seeing the ingenuity, the resourcefulness, the, the ability to respond to market need and carve out your business niche. Through motivations of their own, they take the risks necessary to put forward a venture that will pull together resources, refine their approach, and succeed. Successful entrepreneurs are ne of necessity problem solvers instead of being deterred by an obstacle. A resourceful entrepreneur sees in it opportunity and figures out a way to go forward. I've seen it in the farms, the fishing villages, the hospitals and the sanitation companies, the restaurants, and the hotels the sheep and goat and cattle farms, and the camel dairies. These, are risk -takers. These risk takers are essential for the local economy to grow and provide jobs. But while a strong private sector is not only good for the local economy, it's also a good investment for donors. In a report published by Monitor from Blueprint to Scale, they, take, they make the case for philanthropy in impact investing. In a series of quotes from uh, Louis, Bor Louis Borston, Deputy Director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and former manager at IFC and investment banker at Lehman Brothers, he states, donors can use the power of the pri private sector to deliver improved health, sanitation, and other benefits to the poor. These interventions with the private sector catalyze changes in the way companies, financial institutions, and consumers operate 
rather than simply procuring specific goods or services for beneficiaries. However, funding must always serve as a complement, not substitute for market forces. So what is the social value for, from private sector investment? Number one, sustainability. Once an activity is, activity is shown to be commercially viable, the private sector is likely to sustain it without requiring subsidies. Replication. A success in the private sector naturally leads to imitation by others, and we know that happens, um, who also want to earn a profit, producing replication with diminishing levels of further public support. Leverage. Private capital can be catalyzed to support social objectives, thereby minimizing the use of scarce donor funds. Innovation. Engagement with the private sector provides direct access to new technologies and business models that can meet social objectives more effectively. Efficiency. Working directly with the private sector offers access to the latest management techniques and systems, while also benefiting from the focus on efficient operations demanded by the market. Of course, for donors working with the private sector, there's less control over project implementation, and markets can shift in unexpected ways. But still, at the end of the day, it's the local businesses that will remain to serve customers as long as there is a market demand. So although there's a, sh a shift has already become from aid to sustainable development, for many years, Som Somalia has necessarily been the recipient of large charitable donations and grants. Aid, of course, is necessary to meet specific needs at certain times. But in the long run, large-scale donations and grants aren't sustainable. The result, however, after decades of donations, is the development of a large number of organizations whose primary focus is the delivery of services according to their mission and aligned with donor goals. While there's no question of their value, particularly during the time of development, there's a fundamental difference between the focus of a nonprofit organization where, there must, where they must maximize grants and charitable donations, their equivalent of commercial revenue, and private business whose efforts must focus on customer-facing activities. A business must generate revenues from customers, raise capital from investors, so grants are not intended as a direct substitute for these and shouldn't interfere with the primary customer-facing activities. This is where an intelligent evolution comes into play. While markets are still developing, business concepts are explored and tested, donor funding should support a specific step change that aligns with the needs of business and be carefully designed to reinforce that focus. If well done, this helps prevent the business from inadvertently straying into a nonprofit mindset, losing focus on its customer-facing activities, and replacing their actions to maximize the market in exchange for a focus on raising and servicing grant revenues. Our keynote speaker will go more into more detail about the elements of the entrepreneur ecosystem, the essential domains uh, that entrepreneurs must deal with when, go when growing their business. But before we do that, I want to say a few words uh, about uh, the biggest barrier. One of the sub-themes of this forum is renewable energy. I want to say a few words about that as kind of a teaser for the panel coming up. Somalis consume about 7% of the energy compared to their local neighbors. This is primarily due to the lack of reliable access to and high cost of energy. History tells us when a commodity gets cheaper and cheaper, it gets used in new and unforeseen ways. For Somali businesses to innovate and create local products that are competitive with imports, this has got to change. Otherwise, Somali businesses cannot compete. Later this morning, we'll hear from an expert panel all about Somali renewable energy. However, let me share a little bit of information to pique your interest about advances in renewables from around the world that comes from a series of articles in the most recent Foreign Affairs magazine, this last month's Foreign Affairs. Today's solar power accounts for less than 1% solar, less than 1% of the global energy supply, but is expanding faster than any other power source with an average growth rate of 50% a year for the past six years. So it's the smallest, but it's the fastest growing. Annual installations of photovoltaic panels increased from a capacity of less than 0.3 gigawatts in 2000 to 45 gigawatts in 2014, enough to power more than 7.4 million American homes. In Europe, the market share of renewables rose from 6% of the total in 2006 to 12% by the end of 2013. India's Prime Minister has announced an ambitious goal of building 100 gigawatts of solar power by 2022. 
In India, where 100,000 villages lack access to electricity, solar power is already less expensive and more reliable. The of solar panels, efficient lighting, cell phone chargers, electric water pumps could improve the lives of hundreds of millions. Solar power also eliminates the need to wait for high voltage transmission lines. To reach, to, to reach a town, a leapfrog effect that advances in technology have propelled, much like the leapfrog effect uh, cellular telephones technology in Africa has over traditional landlines. So what are the factors behind such a rise in solar power? Number one, regulatory support. Around the world, governments have enacted pro-solar policies, including requirements for utilities, feed-in tariffs, and subsidies for manufacturers and households who buy them. In Germany, through a series of incentives and regulatory support from 2000 to 2014, solar panel capacity reached from 18, increased from 18 megawatts to more than 12,000 megawatts. Industrialization. Beginning in 2005, around 2005, solar panel manufacturers were chasing growth in global demand. Chinese competition in particular squeezed profit margins, while, uh, which, which forced many suppliers out of business, but also forced improvements of products and economies of scale, cutting costs substantially. Solar panels' costs have fallen 80% since 2005. Prices are still falling by 5% to 12% in the first half of 2014. This is good news. Technical innovation. Efficiency rates in solar panels are increasing, now peaking at 20%, meaning a panel is able to generate 2 watts of electricity for every 10 watts of sun hitting it. Using the latest technology pays dividends, as every percentage point increase in efficiency can translate into a 5% cost reduction on the entire system. Important whenever we think of technical specifications. Financing. Upfront costs for solar can be expensive sometimes as high as 15000 to 20000 for a typical house. New financing models are addressing this problem where households would embrace the technology but need access to credit to do so. Third-party ownership models and innovative finance have allowed customers, consumers to repay on a monthly fixed cost over time, and in California in the, year 2000, in the years 2012 and 13, finance mechanisms such as these accounted for two-thirds of the installations. One reason California leads the country when it comes to solar power. Now, of course, global trends don't always translate to local execution. But there is much to be learned from Somalis, uh, for Somalis, where energy costs are amongst the highest in the world. The economist Amartya Sen has argued that economic development can be achieved only if the poor come to enjoy a set of freedoms, including political participation, safety, and economic opportunity. Access to energy enables each of those fundamental rights, which is why efforts to eradicate poverty cannot afford to ignore it. So that's my pitch for renewable energy. <laughs> Passionate pitch. Okay. I'm off my soapbox and going back to the program, uh, but thank you for listening. I, you know, I'm so thrilled about what's happening with renewable energy throughout all the regions that uh, I, I, uh, I'm just really uh, happy to see it all taking off. So let me introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Sherry Birnbach is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Africa Development Foundation, a public corporation that supports African-led development by providing technical support and seed grants to grassroots enterprises, benefiting underserved populations across Africa. Her distinguished 30-year career spans from microfinance to inter international banking. Most recently at USAID, Ms. Birnbach directed the Office of Microenterprise and Private Enterprise Promotion increasing the reach of financial and market resources to rural areas and smallholder farmers. A pioneer in the impact investing field, Ms. Baerbach spent more than a decade as president and CEO of the Calvert Foundation, a $300 million nonprofit financial intermediary that mobilizes capital from social investors to meet critical financing needs in communities. Ms. Baerbach's earlier international development work included in-country programming in more than two dozen countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Ms. Berenbach served as an investment officer at the International Finance Corporation and also has, <laughs> and also has private sector positions in, at, also held private sector positions at Solomon Brothers Citigroup and a startup telecommunications firm, Radio Mobile Digital. Ms. Berenbach holds an MBA in finance from Columbia Business School, an MA in Latin American Studies from UCLA, an undergrad degree in political science from UC Berkeley. Ms. Berenbach previously served as on the nonprofit not-for-profit advisory com uh, committee 
of the Financial Accounting Standards Board and currently on the board of directors of the Calvert Foundation. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that great introduction. And, and I want to um, begin by, by welcoming everyone here. I'd also like to uh, begin by, by thanking uh, Brian Phipps, the Deputy Special Representative for Somalia, for his opening comments, Manuel Moses, the head of East Africa of the World Bank Group, and of course, Lee Sorensen, and also Alexandra Wise, who's sitting in the front row from Scirocco. Um, I also want to take a moment to introduce the team from the U.S. African Development Foundation. We have with us here Connie Newman, who's standing off over here, and Jeff Gileo. Um, and just to put it in context, the U.S. African Development Foundation is a very small U.S. governmental development agency that focuses on African-led development. And our work in Somalia has been very focused specifically on youth vocational training and job placement. As you've been hearing about the different challenges in Somalia, there is no doubt that the creating jobs and getting youth placed into those jobs is really instrumental for creating peace and prosperity in the region. And for that reason, of all the different areas, the U.S. African Development Foundation is focused primarily on um, the youth training and job placement. Um, so for follow-up interest, that's really where our focus has been. But in this conversation today, I really will be opening up to a much broader array of topics. Um, but most importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here today, for being part of this first Somali Investment Forum. And, and the title of my talk and the point that I want you to walk away with, the most important thing for you to remember from all the words I say today is that the future of the Somali people belongs to you. You are the ones that are going to help define the future going forward. Yes. You may have thought you were coming, uh, just coming to a conference for a few days, that you were gonna meet a few investors or source a few deals, but no, the opportunity and challenge before us is much greater than, and, than any one transaction or any one deal. And it's you who are going to, to come here to help make the difference in Somali, in, in, across the Somali region, because you are the change the Somali people have been waiting for. And I want you to take a moment to look around at all the people that are here today, because you are going to be working together for a long time. And I want you, in fact, to turn to your neighbor, particularly someone you do not yet know, or the person behind you or in front of you, and introduce yourself. Let's just take a moment to do this, because we're here to create a community. Yeah. Hi, Sari. Yes. I'm Lee. Hi, Lee. Nice to meet you. Great. Hi, bro. Hey, how are you? Okay. All right, and as you know, you'll have lots of networking opportunities uh, moving forward. And, and the reason this is so important is that no one person can solve this problem on their own, um, and that the future of Somali belongs to all of you. Um, okay. And, and I do want to emphasize, as I'm saying, that, that no one person, no one Somali, can be the answer to all of the challenges in some, across the Somali region, and that this is something that we have to do together. And let me reassure you, you have come here today together because you want to create a bright future, and it won't necessarily be easy, but I know you will succeed. And, and I know you will succeed because of my past experiences in Somalia. So let me, uh, well, it's Somalia from years past, but let me take a, a few moments just to explain uh, my personal history. Um, I first began my work in Africa as a young woman about 30 years ago, and I worked for a US NGO 
that had support from USAID, and we were setting up microfinance programs in Hargeza, in Baidoa, and other towns in the region. And, and that organization I was with at that time worked in a, a dozen countries across the globe, across the African continent, I should say. But, but the Somali people were always my favorite. And each time I came to Mogadishu, it felt like I had come home. And I was so impressed with the tenacity and the entrepreneurial spirit. And we Americans talk about a can-do spirit. And I know that we Americans share that with the Somali people. We have that can-do spirit that can tackle challenges and create opportunity. And it's for that reason that I always felt so much at home in, Somal in, in, in Mogadishu with the Somali people. And, and I know that, that that is something that will serve you well as you move forward. And of course, the people of Somalia are so warm and so gracious. It was, oh, has, has always been an honor to visit. Anyway, it's because of these experiences 30 years ago that when I was asked if I would give this keynote speech, I said, I'll do whatever it takes to join you in, in Nairobi to be at this first Somali investment forum. So fast forward 30 years, I'm not quite as young <laughs> as I used to be, um, but there are a lot of important new trends that have helped set the stage for a bright future for the Somali region. And in my talk today, I'm going to talk about three trends in particular. The first, the development of entrepreneurship and particularly enabling ecosystems that Scirocco has been discussing. I'm then going to talk about the development of the impact investing industry. And then finally, I'll be talking about technological breakthroughs, such as in renewable energy. So I will be like every other speaker and emphasize the importance of innovation in renewable energy. But for all these trends, I am going to emphasize one important point, and that is success enables success. As we are looking to help build a wonderful future in the Somali region, this is not a zero-sum game. Rather, we talk about a virtuous cycle where one success creates the path to another success. And I'll be explaining that as we look forward in, in these different trends. The first trend, again, is around entrepreneurship and the enabling ecosystem. In the last 30 years, we've learned a lot more about how to support and grow entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurs can lead the way in the future. Of course, Somalis are no strangers to entrepreneurship, but couldn't we be doing more to enable the success of each and every Somali entrepreneur? There is a growing awareness of the importance of an enabling ecosystem that helps to foster entrepreneurship. And it's not just entrepreneurship for the few, because we already have entrepreneurship for the few. We want to talk about entrepreneurship for the many so that every Somali who wants to pursue entrepreneurship can have that opportunity. And Chirac, who's invited us here, talks a lot about the importance of this enabling ecosystem. They point out that access to markets is very essential, as well as business support and development services. I was very impressed that yesterday after my, my interview, um, some gentleman, uh, a Somali now residing in Seattle, came to me and said, I'd like to be a mentor. So we need this kind of mentoring and peer support, business development services so that entrepreneurs can flourish. Business also needs um, qualified human capital. And that's one of the reasons why US African Development Foundation is focused so much on the training of youth and in placement into jobs, because we need good human capital at the worker level and also at the management level. People need access to finance. And there's different kinds of finance that's needed for different stages of business growth. And there are cultural components to entrepreneurship that needs to be fostered and nurtured over time. And finally, there is a need for an enabling policy environment that we all need from a fair and efficient public sector. One important trend to help meet the future of how of the Somali people is that we are all learning how to best support and engage entrepreneurship. My second trend is the growth of the impact investing field. So, so what is impact investing? What are these two words? And what does it mean for the Somali people? Very simply, 
Impact investing is when investors were, uh, and when investors um, both invest for a financial return and also a social return. So investors want to make money on their investments, but they also want to have social impact. And um, in some instances, investors may take, a more mo take on more risk than they normally would, or perhaps a more modest return in exchange for social impact. But that's not always the case. There are some impact investments with robust investment returns and social returns. And this is particularly true in an environment like the Somali Peninsula that has been so starved for capital for so long. Actually, people can make some very good money investing in Somalia. Uh, in the Somali region today, and in so doing, they can also have social impact. Um, it, it may not be apparent, but you're actually looking at one of the founders of the impact investing industry. And um, how I helped to build this impact investing industry is perhaps worth consideration here. Um, in 1997, which we know was a long time ago, um, I was hired by the Calvert Mutual Fund Company. It's a mutual fund company in the United States and I was asked to run their foundation. But rather than it being a foundation that would give money away, we were asked to be a financial intermediary, and we actually created an investment product, an investment note that we sell to the general public, and the investment capital we raise, we then placed as loans to microfinance groups, producers associations, many housing developers, many kinds of often nonprofits that were using this capital to have direct impact. And um, we started this as a very small endeavor, um, but I'm happy to say that between 1997 and 2010, uh, when I completed my work at the foundation, we, we were running a half a billion dollar industry, a half a billion dollars of assets under management by the Calvert Foundation. So this idea that seemed wild and crazy when we started really began to take off. So how did this happen? When I started Calvert Foundation, I recognized that to create a, you, to create a whole new way to think about investment, it wasn't about one organization or one financial intermediary but we needed to reach scale, and we needed to crowd in as many other people and organizations. So whenever I found anyone who was interested in this idea of investing to create social impact, my, I had just five words for them, five different words. How can I help you? That's it. I went to everyone else who was looking at this area, and I said, how can I help you to become a successful impact investor? And we actually created a side of Calvert Foundation that gave away everything that we knew how to do to others on a fee-for-service basis. And it was by sharing ideas and experiences and learnings across a range of different organizations that we created something much bigger than any one organization could do on its own. Uh, about 2007, Rockefeller Foundation came up with the name Impact Investing and brought many others to the table as well. And today, uh, Impact Investing is a multi-billion dollar approach to investing that's spanning the globe. So you might be saying, how is this relevant to me? And it is true in a couple of ways. First, it's important to recognize that investors who are coming to the Somali region, they may be looking for financial return, but they are looking to make a difference. We all know that there are easier places to make money. So if all somebody wanted to do was make money, they would not necessarily come, on, come to the Somali region. Um, and second, it's important to recognize for each and every one of you here, that we need to work together to rebuild the economy in the region. An investment in one enterprise creates a source of supply or the market for another enterprise. And this is what I was saying earlier about the interconnection. If one enterprise enables another. I was interviewing yesterday uh, the gentleman, uh, Saeed, who has a renewable energy company. His renewable energy company is now making it possible for another enterprise to be successful. You know, every enterprise that might, might 
create animal feed is making it possible for a poultry operation to be successful. Businesses actually, we, we always think of businesses being competitive, but in fact, businesses enable other businesses. So your investments, your activities opens the doors for others. And, and as we all know, the Somali diaspora, many of those of you who are here in this room are the true impact investors. You want to make money with your investment, but you want to benefit the Somali people. You want to see peace and prosperity in the region. Yesterday after my talk, I was so impressed by the number of people who came up to me and said, how can I help? How many of you here want to make a contribution, want to see growth and opportunity back in, in your home country? Anyway, the next and final trend I'd like to focus on is innovation. And this, again, is an area where the Somali people have excelled. Um, as you know, the Somalis have been um, uh, very early adopters of the cell phone technology, which has facilitated communication, connecting people together. Equally important, however, is a new innovation around renewable off-grid energy. And it's interesting that each and every speaker is talking about this. We didn't even compare notes beforehand. Um, and, and, it's, and, and it's absolutely essential because, as it's been said, it is simply not possible to build a competitive, uh, a competitive Somali region with energy costs of $1 per kilowatt hour. If we don't tackle the energy issues, it will not be possible. But the bright light here is that there is a new generation of technology that is coming forward that needs entrepreneurial spirit, it needs investments, it needs this can-do spirit, and, and I have no doubt in my mind that many of you here in the room are up to the challenge to help invent a whole new way to deliver energy to rural communities that won't be dependent on the grid, that will use renewable energy, and that will begin to lower the cost and make more accessible and affordable energy to support households, but also in particular to support small businesses. So, and once again, this notion of one enterprise enabling another to flourish, it's these renewable energy entrepreneurs that will enable the rest of Somalia to flourish. One enterprise enables another. Together is how we can move forward. So, where does this come to? My vision, how do these trends come together? What does this mean for the region of Somalia? My vision for the Somalia people, and I believe it's a vision I share with many of you, is a Somali region where there are opportunities for hundreds and thousands of small and medium enterprises. And that these enterprises will be owned by men and by women. They will be employing youth and growing the economy from the ground up. You will have an environment where there are resources and information that the businesses need to flourish. And in my vision, the Somali Peninsula becomes a hub for the region, enabling its own growth and the growth of others. As we build out this vision together, there are just a couple little items of caution I do want to put forward. And, and part of that caution is to think that the answer to your problems are going to come from outside of this room. Um, first, there's been a lot of talk about the need for commercial banks. Um, people have been saying, oh, we have great opportunity, but there aren't enough commercial banks. Um, and, there, and it does seem that there are a number of commercial banks on the scene. And, and banks are very important. I don't mean to diminish this. They, they are particularly important to link Somali enterprises to export markets by providing layers of credit. They're also very important by providing a safe place to save. Um, it's important to remember, though, and maybe I say this as a former banker, and I'm sure there's a number of former bankers in the room, is that banks don't lend to startups. Um, they also are very reluctant to lend to brand new sectors and new regions. It's not going to be likely that the commercial banking sector is going to lend to brand new renewable energy companies, nor is it likely that the commercial banking sector will be the first capital that will come into a new enterprise in one of the regions um, in, across um, uh, the Somali Peninsula. So while we look forward to and welcome commercial banks, let's not think that they are the answer for everything. 
Um, we're going to need different kinds of investment capital to really spark the kind of growth that you'd like to see. The other thing is there's also been a lot of talk about the importance, the economists talk about the importance of direct foreign investment, that you want a Chevron to come or some large corporation or another to come and pour their, their capital and technology into the Somali region. That will happen, but not right away. You need to be thinking about having a sound business environment before those large institutional investors will be knocking on your door. What we can look to today is all of you in this room now. You are the answer that the Somali people are looking for. You are the ones who are committed to the region. You have the entrepreneurial spirit. You have the management capacity. And many of you have capital to invest and are really committed to investing it into the region. So, so as we build this vision together, it, it's important to recognize that the answer doesn't lie in some far offshore. The answer lies in each and every one of you. And, and I'd like to conclude on one remark, on one point that the other speakers have also raised. And that is, in order for all of us to be successful, we do need an effective public sector that creates a level playing field, that establishes standards, that ensures property rights. And so while the private sector needs to be leading, we do in fact need to look at an, a robust public sector that is prepared to make its contribution to create the enabling environment so that all these businesses can succeed. So with that, I'd like to just wrap up and conclude and say, the future of the Somali people begins with you. It's your tenacity and determination that will make the difference. It's your impact capital and your belief in the Somali people that will allow the Somali region to be successful. The Somali region can only be realized if all of us work together to create the region we want to see. So with that, I say thank you. <laughs>